Um, we are still waiting for a few people to find their way in. Um, but I think we may as well start uh, and let people drift in as we go. Uh, so firstly, welcome and thank you all very much for coming to this event uh, for Refugee Week. Uh, I'm Julian Huppert and I'm the director of the new Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College. Um, and welcome to our new venue. I hope you like it. This is the first public event that has happened in this new lecture hall, which has only just been opened. So um, we will hopefully get everything right um, as we go. Um, and I hope you'll be interested. If you are interested in booking any of the facilities we have here, we have a lot of them. Please do get in touch. We can do tours later. The aim of this new centre that we have is to try to use the college, to use the university, to look at important issues that make a difference to society, whether that is Cambridge, whether that's national, whether that's global. Uh, we do a whole range of events. We've already done things looking at the future of work, looking at ageing, looking at climate change, um, as well as this issue uh, here on refugees. Uh, it's very wide. Some of our events will be public, some of them will be private. Do go to our website and sign up if you'd like to know more about the sort of things uh, that we're doing. Um, but hopefully it'll be quite a useful activity. One of the things that we do is these directors' discussions where the idea is to have some expert panellists, and we have an expert panel here, but not just to have that traditional style where people uh, give their lectures and then you listen passively and ask a couple of questions, but to try to actually get some engagement on a topic. Uh, so I hope you will be listening and thinking about things that you'd like to talk about, that you'd like to discuss with other people here, like to discuss uh, with the panel. That will make it a much more interesting. Why refugees? Well, frankly, it's an important topic around the world. It's a topic that's very dear to my heart. Um, I had a political career, as some of you know, um, and one of the things I did during that was to be chair of the all-party parliamentary group on refugees. This was before the most recent crisis. But this country has a track record, sadly, of not always getting things right, not always sorting out uh, the issues fairly for refugees often forgetting that refugees are people just like us, people who should be treated with basic decency and basic dignity. We managed to get some stuff then, but there is a lot more to go. And the recent crisis in uh, and around Syria has made this much more pressing. It's been great to see how many people have got involved. You'll be pleased to know that my role won't be to give you a long monologue. Um, it will be instead be to try to make sure that the discussion moves along. And instead we do have our wonderful panel. So we have Professor Madeleine Arnott, who's a Professor of Education and also works quite a lot on migration issues. We'll hear uh, from her. We'll then hear from uh, Councillor Lewis Herbert, who is the leader of the City Council here. So great expertise in what Cambridge is doing at the moment. And Dr. Eric Katz from the uh, Department of Architecture looking at uh, the settings for many, many of these things. So before we hear from them though, we've organised this with partners. It's always much better to work uh, with other partners. I'm delighted to have uh, Jenny here uh, from CIRC, one of the two partners that we have. So Jenny, if you want to say a couple of minutes about who you are and what you've all been doing, we'll then start the main event. Thank you, Julian. It's a bit loud, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm from Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign, CRC, and so just behalf, uh, on behalf of us and of the Cambridge City of Sanctuary group, who also co-organised this event, just want to say thank you very much for coming, thank you to our panellists, and thank you, of course, to the Intellectual Forum for hosting us here and there, for allowing us to inaugurate their new um, lecture hall. Um, CORC is a local charity working in Cambridge. We are just a volunteer group, and we work with the... The families that have been resettled in Cambridge, uh, the Syrian refugee families have been resettled through the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme already. So we help with the council to support them with their needs. And we also run a housing campaign, which is trying to secure more housing, more affordable housing, more private landlord housing, um, to, in order to enable us to resettle more families here. So that we've committed to resettling 100 Syrian refugees under this scheme, and we're hoping that we can enable, by, by making more housing available, we can... We can uh, make that happen. Um, as you know, this event is also part of Refugee Week. There are lots of events happening in Cambridge all throughout the week, so I'd really encourage you to take part in that, look it up, take part and attend much more events because it's really a, a worthwhile thing to get involved in. There's a lot of energy around it at the moment. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. Two things I forgot to say. One is, if you hear a fire alarm, please do leave, either that way or that way, and assemble in the uh, courtyard. The porters will look after everything. The other thing is, we are filming this entire event. We have cameras um, up there. If you do not wish to be filmed, um, if you could sit over there, that would be helpful. We'll make sure not to film you. Um, but otherwise, we will try and capture all of this uh, and produce an edited version of it. Um, that's uh, more than enough from me. Uh, Madeline, over to you. Um, I'm very 
very delighted to be here. It's an extremely important issue. Um, it's something that I've been working on since about 2007. Uh, I'm looking at the education of refugee children and asylum-seeking children. I'm, uh, normally we put the two together, refugee and asylum-seeking children. Um, sorry, I couldn't put this on. Um, the, the theme, and it's a theme right across Europe now, is about how to integrate uh, refugee children. Um, all, all these different countries of Europe that have taken large numbers of refugees are having debates, conferences, etc. So that's the discussion. Um, migration, this is not a new wave. My, our, our view really is, is it not, is that migration is going to, is the 21st century issue and the refugees, the Syrian refugees who are arriving are part of a, a, of a global phenomenon. That's why it's a very good title today, Act, Lo uh, Act Locally, Thinking Globally, and that's the framework I'm going to talk about. Um, from the school system point of view, um, it's a huge challenge. We have school systems that are designed to create national citizens. And here we have children, large numbers of children, whose uh, English is not their first language, their home language. Um, London has something like um, three, 360 languages. Um, we've got children who might be speaking five languages, not just bilingual children. Um, the other aspect of it for the school system is with children have different relationships to the state. And that is is becoming quite a key issue. Um, it'll become even more of an issue with Europeans in, in the UK um, and how they are going to be defined. Um, we've got economic migrants, children, refugees, asylum seekers, etc. So the, the, the status of children in relationship to the state is now becoming very topical and we now have that category which we used in our book of the, of the difference between a citizen child and a non-citizen child. The child who doesn't have the rights in our state. Um, and of course the children are transitory, they, some of them have absolutely no schooling whatsoever, some of them have very good schooling. From an educational perspective, they're children first, migrant second. Um, and the, um, the, 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 that positions the school system in a very particular way vis-a-vis -vis the state. It puts teachers in a different relationship to the state. Teachers have to deal with quite a lot of very stressful issues, whether it's deportation or whether it's uh, distressed children and families, um, uh, difficult communities. Some teachers in our studies talked about how they had to deal with Daily Mail readers, the families of Daily Mail readers, who had, of course, mobilized very hostile reactions to, to immigrants. Um, so we've, we've, to put it into perspective from where we are in Cambridge, and I was recently in Sweden, um, Sweden has accepted 70,000 refugees under children under 18. 70,000. 35,000 of them are unaccompanied. So we are actually looking at a very, very small amount of children, but that does not mean that we shouldn't actually be thinking about what the role of the school system is in this current context and the, mo the way it's going, the challenge which we can debate, it's not about the refugee child or family adapting to us, it's our, us adapting to the realities of, the, of, the, of migration. Um, and the UNESCO report, City Refugees, actually says it's about urban governance. It's about thinking and localizing human rights-based approaches within the city. Question, are we going far enough in our own city here? Um, are we using that as a framework within that city, in our own city? Are we integrating on an interagency approach that supports those families? And I, I think that would be something I'd be most interested in hearing. Um, the, the two challenges I wanted to raise with you uh, for discussion are the challenges, the first one is the politics of belonging. Um, if we want refugee children to feel that they belong, it really begs the question, um, how do we wish them to identify themselves in our society? Um, and uh, this, is, this is the non-citizen child, if you like. When we interviewed refugee and asylum-seeking children in this, in this area, in East Anglia and, and local um, counties, we asked them how they saw themselves. They saw themselves with hybrid identities. They are, are fluid, moving identities. They certainly wanted to be British. Um, the problem is that, of course, the, uh, a lot of the, the um, citizen children who are of mixed ethnic groups, they were the ones who said they could be British, but they can't easily be English. And I'm raising that with you. What is British? What is English? Can these children ever become English? Some children actually said they could become quite English, but not actually English. Uh, um, and the t criteria for Englishness is actually eating fish and chips. Um, 
we have endemic in our society historically a dualism between us and them. We have a culture that has always, it seems, had a problem with the stranger. And it's not clear from the educationist point of view that we've actually um, changed that, challenged that at a very deep level. Question, has multiculturalism gone far enough? Are we still operating with a dualism that we are looking at strangers? And certainly there is a problem of how do you belong to this society, this British or English society. And when you get a government report saying securing our borders, that's actually far more important than offering a safe haven. And that does beg the question, where does it leave belonging? Um, the, the, there, are, there are issues too that the refugee children we interviewed actually found it quite difficult to engage with some of the British kids, particularly the urban kids, although this was London, not Cambridge, um, because they said they were dis disrespectful to teachers, they used very poor language, they were, they were sometimes violent, and they also were stealing. And why should they become like them? So this is again an issue, how do refugee children, particularly Muslim children, perceive the British child? Um, the advice we're getting from, UNES from um, the UNESCO debate re uh, report that's just come out, it says we should find a way of removing the statelessness of children and a way of, of engaging in our, our, our cultural ethos. And this, of course, begs the issue, should we get involved in um, British values debate? The second one, very quickly, is the, lit the litmus test. The presence of refugee children in our school system is a litmus test on how inclusive the school culture is. How are the schools adapting? And we went into schools and we asked them, what is compassion? How do you create it in the children? the children in the school. And the teachers, we found, was, were unbelievably caring. We had chosen schools with good practice, and that's in our region. Um, they were unbelievably caring. One, ca one could argue, and it has been argued, that teachers and social workers are, in fact, the humanist, humanitarian face of Britain. They're, the children themselves say the teacher is the most important person I have met and who has helped me. Um, and they have extraordinary respect for the help that they've got from teachers. Um, the PGC students in this college, when I interviewed them about working with diversity, there was an excitement uh, and a sense of, I want to work in a school with diversity. It's an educational challenge for me. Um, so there's incredible caring culture. It's almost as if some teachers uh, see themselves as mothers and fathers of the refugee child. Um, but there is also a sense of individualizing those children, of actually seeing their needs at a highly individual level rather than a group level. Um, and there, that, that can actually not empower the refugee child. And so I want to raise the issue is how do we empower refugee children and their families, not just address their needs? Um, in our recent research we've done, we also were very concerned about the parents and working with the parents. I think all parents have issues about how they relate, for example, to secondary schools. And the question is, how much are we communicating what the principles of our system are so that the parents we interviewed who didn't understand GCSEs, how to make choices, choosing careers, helping their children, it was not clear that schools had an outreach approach. Um, it was n that, that we are behind from the American style uh, uh, experience where the parents are being empowered on school boards. And so there are many things that we can do that have much more um, innovative and experimental in this region, um, which draws on what people call the cultural capital or the funds of knowledge that refugee families and their children bring to it. And we're also incredibly behind on how we could use digital technologies to do that. Um, so there, are, there is a lot of lessons to be learned from other countries, from other cities. Um, where we should be part of the European debate. I say that with caution, um, and that we hopefully are part of that debate about what is inclusion? What do you mean? And I'm raising that for debate. What is inclusion and integration in a culture? What does it have to look like? Because the, the teachers are having to create that and work with it, and it's not clear what that is. And there's even a new word has come into the vocabulary, the desolidarization, and that the solidarity with the newly arrives is, has broken down to a certain extent. How do you create solidarity with the stranger? So those are the issues that I, I, I would hope to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some, some really interesting stuff.
stuff there. This idea that migrants, it, that is the 21st century challenge, children of state, politics of belonging, and how to empower refugee families, how to do things with them rather than just to them. So some really good stuff which we'll come back to um, as, as you'd like. Um, but we'll now turn to Councillor Lewis Herbert um, to, to talk from the, the City Council's perspective. Well, I'll, I'll go a little bit wider than that because um, I think the starting point is really... Um, uh, that some of the threads that, that you've, you've heard really about just how many migrants are coming into Europe or how many migrants are leaving uh, countries that are war-torn or damaged. So if you just look at not just Syria, but you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, um, certainly um, I, I think Julian and I agree on quite a lot of the analysis that, that we actually were part of the cause as well as um, uh, not actually coming in to help. So. If, if you start with just say the standing point of the Cambridge community and uh, what it would like to do, it would take a very different view um, than the Home Secretary that made the decisions and the government that made the decisions, including at that sort of fateful event, um, uh, a, a dead child on a Greek beach, um, which was the only event that really jolted um, the Cameron government to do something. So I think we start with the, f the willingness in this community to do a lot more than our government actually will let us do. And if you just look at the numbers, um, and it was mentioned that um, uh, Sweden alone is taking 70,000 um, children, that the total commitment of the UK government is 20,000 um, Syrian refugees. Clearly, it does help with other programmes, and obviously there are other refugees or asylum seekers rightly getting here under their own accord. But, but, but in terms of uh, proportionality, our contribution as a country is tiny. Um, including because if we roll back into who caused the problem, then we've seriously undermined places like uh, Iraq, particularly Libya was almost our own doing. Um, and so, so we, we, we are as a community willing to do a heap more, um, but the government are controlling the borders and particularly when um, the uh, refugee camp at Calais was closed and the border was put up, um, that significantly reduced the number of people that are coming in. So, so uh, just to take one thread of that, um, there are in the south and east of England um, 1,500 unaccompanied child um, asylum seekers. Um, I don't know the derivation, but a significant number of them came off the back of lorries. A lot of them were traveling alone or in groups. A lot of them had been sent away from their original communities um, right across the Middle East and into Africa because it was thought that they would be the future and they were given a chance, they were given funds to, to make that journey. So there is a hidden issue which um, now that we've um, at least got a government, um, uh, I hope that they will um, be um, public and address because all the way through the European referendum and a lot of other issues, there are a lot of burying of some of these issues. So there are, there are 1,500 unaccompanied children in social services using up most of the adoption facilities um, in, uh, in children's homes um, across the southeast of England, in, and that's in addition to the paltry number that the government allowed in um, when it made minor concessions after the Dubs Amendment. So, so we, they've got that number. So, so what? So, so that also is part of a, a wider number of refugees within um, within Cambridge. So, if I go down that thread, um, we. Um, but particularly Cambridge Ethnic Community Forum with input from other organisations has undertaken a survey of the number of refugees and asylum seekers in, in Cambridge. It, it isn't as large a number as in many English cities. Um, cost of housing, uh, whilst we've got a wide ethnic diversity, not the kind of host communities that there are in, in, in some cities, in Manchester or in, in London. But that, that, that survey um, found obviously a, a, a number and uh, we'll be discussing with agencies, with them, with the County Council, how to better support that. So following that survey, which I think is, uh, is, be is being published, um, there is then an analysis of what the needs are, what the support needs. Um, anecdotally, I don't think the survey could find the number of refugees that are in the city. I call, just as Julian did, we knocked on a lot of doors and in one evening, in one housing area, I came across three families with different stories. Um, a Kurdish family from Turkey, 
um, a family that had come from Iran and also a family that had come from Iraq. And that was just one evening's calling on doors. So, and quite rightly, and coming back to the points that have been made, those three families have actually settled. They are independent, their children are at school, they are part of the community, uh, their mothers in particular are English speaking and, um, and are earning money. So they have, over a period of time, probably assisted by being reasonably articulate to start with, they had, um, they, they've settled. So, so we, we literally do not know the numbers in the city, um, and a lot of the people there are relatively independent, but could probably benefit. Uh, streaming into the program with uh, the government program, yes, 20,000, um, a promise in September 2015 over four or five years. Um, February 2017, um, government press release saying that 5,000 have, have been settled. Uh, they tend to be non-English speakers, they tend to come from the camps um, on the, which contain five or six million perhaps in total. Um, they, uh, they, they are families. There's very limited um, uh, range in a way. That there's been some character typing by um, UNHCR and the government to decide who's coming. Um, but there is a wonderful support, it's been mentioned by Jenny, there's a lot of community input, but there's, there's, there's a lot more the community wants to do than we have um, people that, that are there that we can help. So uh, we have settled today, to date, including in the last uh, week, another couple of families. We've got um, about 30 children and about 20 adults. Um, there are children being born here, they are very happy. Uh, they, are, they are nurturing as a community. We do not give them any publicity. They prefer at the moment to um, uh, just settle. But they get most support from their own, the other families that have arrived, along with um, two Arabic speakers. We can expand the program, but we've had all sorts of blocks from uh, the government on, on trying to do that. So I've just characterized that, but I do say, there is that well of generosity and the ability um, to do more and as these families settle in and they are around Cambridge in different locations and beyond Cambridge but supported by us, a lot more will happen but I hope that, that gives you a bit of an introduction. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lewis, some really good stuff there, looking at the root cause. But then also I think you're absolutely right that there is appetite here in Cambridge to do far more than is possible to do. I wish that was the case across the whole country. Um, but it is great to see that there is so much appetite here to look. Uh, Cambridge is a very internationalist city. <coughs> And the third, definitely not, not last, we'll hear from all of you in a bit, uh, Irit Katz. It'll be great to hear from you. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll quickly introduce my work. Um, I've been working on uh, refugee and migrant camps in Israel, Palestine uh, in the last few years and uh, just finished my PhD on the subject in 2015 when the European uh, migration, so-called migration uh, crisis uh, started and I've uh, started working on this uh, subject as well. Uh, and as uh, someone who is coming from a... Oop, that's the end, so you just in the hole. Uh, as someone who is coming uh, from from the architectural discipline, slides are part of my uh, my quick uh, presentation. So. Uh, in the past, when we uh, talked about uh, housing and shelter for refugees, and I'll speak mostly about housing and shelter, and I know in Cambridge it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a problem because of the, of the cost of housing, etc. So the images in our minds were uh, usually uh, camps like these, uh, created by the UNHCR, which is the UN, uh, UN Refugee Agency, usually in uh, remote regions. But over the last few years, uh, there have been two major uh, changes related to refugee absorption. So the first change is that mainly since, two th since 2015, uh, so-called migration crisis, we could, we could see uh, more and more refugee camps and other refugee spaces formed in Europe. And this change is related uh, to ongoing violent conflicts in uh, Syria and elsewhere and to the global increase in the number of displaced people, uh, today more than uh, 65 million and uh, before that uh, the, the, the part of UK and the whole situation was mentioned but yeah obviously it's a, it's a political issue as well. 
Um, so similar refugee uh, spaces existed in uh, Europe in the past. It's not a, a very new thing. Uh, after World War II, after the Bosnian War in the early 90s, uh, but these spaces uh, reappeared on quite a large scale when, the two, uh, when in 2015 over one million refugees uh, have reached Europe. So this is the, the first change, the, the, the fact that we can see such refugee spaces around us. And uh, I can see people here who are, went, uh, went with, uh, to the jungle uh, when it uh, existed. And, uh, and it's, I guess, the fact that these spaces exist just across the border, just across, uh, on the other side of the channel, is, is very much part of, the, of, the, of why people are aware of their existence. So this, the second change, or, or trend as you can call it, is that uh, in our urbanizing world, we can also see the urbanization of refuge. Refugees and displaced people increasingly arrive to urban areas and absorbed in cities. Today over 60% of the world refugees lived in urban environment. And, uh, and, and again, it's an important trend. So we don't, uh, we don't see uh, refugees only in camps, but also in cities. And a, a part of, as, as part of this change, there is also the new UNHCR uh, policy called Alternatives to Camps, uh, in which the UN itself tr is trying to find urban, urban alternatives to, to uh, the exclusion of people in camp. So how do cities absorb refugees? And, and we'll later talk about Cambridge, hopefully, together. In Europe, we can see, we can or could see such makeshift and in institutional camps, uh, as you can see here, in Calais, Dunkirk, Paris, Berlin, and elsewhere. Um, two official refugee camps were lately uh, opened in Paris um, just a few months ago. And similar to other cities around the world, which experience a large influx of influx of refugees, we can also see uh, oh, these, sorry, yes, we can also see these forms of uh, squatting or informal living in abandoned sites, just such as the Olympic Village in Turin, which hosted the, the Winter Games in 2006, and the Plaza Hotel in Athens, where uh, 400 refugees are now hosted. <coughs> These spaces uh, were squatted by refugees and supported by uh, local volunteers and NGOs. But in Europe, you can also find other more formal institutional forms of refugee absorption, which appeared in recent years. For example, in many cities in Germany, we can see you can find such refugee housing projects, like you can see uh, uh, in the two photos uh, above. Some of them built for only temporary use. Uh, one of them is in uh, in Hamburg, and the other one in a city called Kuningspuren. And these projects were rapidly designed and built in 2015 and 2016, and you can see many of them in uh, just the uh, recently close actually, the German uh, pavilion in the last year's architectural biennale in, uh, in Venice. And uh, below there, there is the website, you can, s you can find there, there uh, 73 uh, different projects that were uh, built in uh, Germany. Sorry. Another example um, is the housing project uh, below in Amsterdam for fi 550 young adults under the age of 28. And you mentioned earlier the, 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 the unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied minors, and uh, I guess this is al also relevant. Half of them are Dutch, students and uh, others who cannot afford Am Amsterdam's high rents. And the other half are refugees, which recently arrived from uh, the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere. In this project, these two groups are encouraged to socialize and to do uh, things together and, um, uh, and to uh, connect uh, with one another. So again, this is another, um, this is another example of, of refugee absorption. And we can discuss together whether it's a, it's, it's a good uh, form of absorption or, or, or not. So there is a lot of things going on. Um, and, and, and a lot of things are changing all the time because, again, this is an ongoing situation. Some people call it a crisis, and uh, I guess the, the ongoing flows of, of refugees became, in a way, the new norm uh, in which, uh, which we should uh, cope with. 
So these are only part of the forms refugees are hosted in cities in Europe and uh, elsewhere. Sometimes they are being hosted in local family homes, uh, stay with friends or relatives, rent accommodation, as it was mentioned before. In many cases, uh, they rent substandard homes, uh, but they are also uh, housed in, in uh, government or municipal facilities like sports halls, etc. In the UK and in Cambridge, refugees are absorbed in rented houses as part of the community, which is an important, a very important issue, and supported by NGOs and groups of volunteers, such as uh, uh, the CRRC, uh, which was mentioned earlier, and, and Jenny is here, and others, uh, the Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign. What is important for me to emphasize here is that refugees are absorbed uh, in urban environments in very different forms. And there is always a place for creative thinking about the subject. And again, hopefully we'll be able to discuss it here. So of course this is not an easy subject and it doesn't end with housing solutions. Refugees are often vulnerable people who need support. Uh, some of them, yeah, there, there are people like us, but they've been through uh, very difficult uh, periods and events and journeys. And uh, before uh, I finish and we'll be able to discuss together about the subject, I, will just, want, I just want to mention uh, uh, UN Habitat 3, the UN Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Environment uh, Development, sorry, hosted in Quito in uh, October 2016. So its central document is called the New Urban Agenda, uh, which, uh, it is, which calls for inclusion of urban refugees within existing city structures, affirming the importance of urban space in refugee protect protection. Article 28 of the New Urban Agenda argues that, and I quote, although the movement of large populations into towns and cities poses a variety of challenges, it can also bring significant social, economic, and cultural contribution, contributions to urban life. So I'll just end with a question. Can Cambridge get uh, an inclusive, uh, set an inclusive and creative example for urban refugee absorption? And uh, this is a, a, um, a question I hope to discuss today. And I think Cambridge could offer an innovative uh, approach to the subject. So thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Irit. Um, some really interesting stuff there on the scale globally. It was interesting to see the images and to be reminded, you know, that countries like Jordan are taking way more refugees by orders of magnitude than we're even talking about um, here in the UK. Um, and I think some of the refugee housing projects were interesting. And that, and that point at the end about the benefits that you get for, from taking refugees. So we've had some fascinating uh, discussions uh, looking at the source of the problems, the scale of the problems, about education, about housing, about Cambridge. It's now over to all of you. Um, and I think we have people with roving microphones. Fantastic. So if you'd like to... Oops. Me. Um, if, if you have anything to say, and this isn't one of these times where we encourage just brief questions, do put a hand up in the air and we'd be interested in your thoughts, comments, challenges on any of this. Responses to any of the questions. Yes, over there. Um... <coughs> I was very concerned about the numbers of refugees and um, allegedly um, illegal migrants in Grenville Towers, those who survived and those who, you know, tragically lost their lives. And I've been reading in the media that many people who survived are now frightened to come forward to access the benefits that they're entitled to because of their immigration status. Um, or their refugee status, and I'm just wondering <sighs> how we can how we can mitigate that kind of situation. Um, you know, you were talking about high housing refugees in urban developments, and now it seems like huge numbers of our sort of um, tower blocks have extraordinary difficulties associated with fire risk that have to be solved. So. Um, yeah, I don't know what you're thinking on that is. Any other? Yes, we'll take a few comments from people on, on that or any other issues and then we'll come back, yeah. So I'll offer, uh, I'm Lauren Stigler, I'm with uh, Angler Ruskin University. I'll offer uh, an anecdotal story from the US, I'm not really sure if it applies much here, but um, I was working uh, for some time with the resettled family who was uh, settled in project housing, or I guess as you say, council housing. 
And uh, interestingly, what happened was that the family was largely ostracized by neighbors on the street um, because of customs that uh, the neighbors thought were unorthodox. And um, on one occasion, I even saw children walking down the street and spitting on the lawn of, of this resettled refugee family. So um, that was just uh, an observation that I've experienced. And, um, and in that moment, I wondered if it was appropriate, and uh, this point was already brought up, um, to try to integrate uh, families from diverse backgrounds into already economically stressed uh, areas or neighborhoods. And that's just uh, the first point. <laughs> The second point, um, if, if uh, the city is considering integrating refugee families, uh, not into council housing, but um, elsewhere in the city, it would be interesting to look at really creative solutions. For example, in Germany, where um, city councils try to combat multiple problems at, at once. So for example, um, for landlords who want to um, make changes to their home to better insulate their homes or add solar panels. Um, if they agree to, to rent their uh, homes out at a subsidized cost for refugee families or students um, or low income earners, the government then steps in and helps pay for those uh, renovations. So at the same time, you're um, improving the housing stock of the city while offering uh, affordable housing, not in chunks of council housing, but uh, spread out throughout the city. So it'd be interesting to hear more creative, innovative solutions like that. Some really interesting ideas. I saw another hand up at the back there. People on this side are also allowed to, to comment, or indeed at the back. Thank you. Um, it's a question that's related to the, the previous one as well around the idea of finding policy innovations or lesson learning um, from other countries because clearly resettlement of refugees, as has been noted, um, has a long history and uh, many countries are dealing with similar issues and have been over the, the last few decades. So the question is what opportunities exist for this kind of lesser learning for a city like Cambridge from other countries. And I was also very interested if there was any more discussion around the idea of the localization of human rights. I think that's a really interesting framework to think about given the wider things that are happening nationally and um, regionally. Great. I mean, you are welcome to respond to the comments that have been made by other people as well. Um, but if nobody feels, oh, yeah, up there, and then. Uh, it's actually more a question than a comment. Y you mentioned that there were 1,500 unaccompanied minors, I think, in the UK. Um, so I'd like to understand more about what's the process for welcoming those children, uh, whether they are being placed in families or whether they are uh, even you know, legally able to be placed in families. Uh, and then over there. This is a question perhaps for Eret, because I think your work works on it, but we've talked about various refugee camps, but we have refugee camps in Jordan that are 50 years old. I wondered if you'd say something about these camps that are, you know, we've got fourth, fifth, sixth generation, uh, and of course this isn't just in Jordan, the old camps all over, and, and um, how, how, what you think the future of these is. So I don't know if any of the panel want to comment on any of the things that we've heard. I mean, a, a very rich range. I'll come back to, to people out here in a moment. Uh, anybody feel like picking up any of these issues about aftermath of that awful fire, about sort of how you house people? Lewis? Well, I, uh, yeah, I'll, if, I, if I just uh, walk into a couple of the points. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the living expert on the 1500. That's an estimate. They largely came in, um, in through Dover. And they basically there's been an arrangement between all of the social care authorities, largely county councils, to provide um, care. Um, quite a lot have been uh, uh, fostered, um, so they're in family environments. 
um, they clearly need specific support and I think there has been the albeit that the number of care homes for children has reduced sometimes for good reasons there's um, there's been quite a lot of sort of organized care the um, yeah, the, it, it's largely been the county councils along with um, the national agencies that have been looking at that. Clearly the issue is, um, where are their family connections, what is, what's their future, do they have the right to stay, a whole range of issues in that. Where will they go when they get to 18, will they be in a position to be semi-independent but still supported? Um, in terms of, I mean, I, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the whole issue of Grenfell Tower is going to be a big stain on the country. Um, and uh, I obviously, like many, you, you try and dig information, and Twitter does provide interesting information. And there was a photo montage, I think uh, something like the second or third day, of the families on particular floors, particularly near the top. So um, I, 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 it, it must be difficult in London, it must be difficult near Heathrow. The local authorities are just given the problem in the sense that there isn't, I mean, just as the Prime Minister has admitted that there was no plan for dealing with the uh, impact of that fire or proper follow-up. There isn't really, I'm, I'd expect, a very well uh, thought-through plan in terms of reception. And that's the same for people coming from Dover or from Heathrow or other places. And so it's, it's a, there's more of a sort of, uh, a, the, needs, the needs have justified this route. Um, so, I mean, in, in Cambridge, it's, it, we're in a, a different environment. We haven't been a major settlement point for uh, um, asylum seekers. Um, not like, I mean, as the contributor from Angli Ruskin in the Northeast, they painted the doors a particular colour. And that signified the places where the asylum seekers were living. Um, so, in, in Cambridge, this, the numbers are smaller, the integration is good, the culture, the welcome, the lack of hate crime in the city. Um, so, the, the, if you took all of the refugees that are in the city, they are often in very good housing, and rightly so. They're, they need to be self-contained, they're often families. Some of them are in flats, housing association flats. A lot of them, certainly in, in the programme that we've been gradually putting together. It's not a huge number, but it, it means that we're able to provide quality accommodation. Uh, that's a partial answer. Either do you want to? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we've, it's, there's, there's a, a very interesting gap between housing and education, and, and um, very often the government and dispersed people according to housing rather than the educational needs of the child. Um, I think that the, there is still much more to be done in terms of um, when the question around um, how do we assess them on an initial arrival. Um, one of the things we've discovered from our research is that um, there is no such thing at the moment, I think, I think, well we certainly haven't found it, on bilingual assessment. So children are assessed on English. And that's why the team is trying to develop um, assessment tools, because of course you could be an incredibly successful learner, you could have a fantastic abilities in certain subjects, but you're, it won't come through because you can't speak enough English. So if, the, uh, if English is the only way of testing those children, you could lose, lose information on their, on their capability and their ability. Also, we don't collect information sufficiently on their educational histories. Um, and therefore, we might lose. You might find a fantastic um, a sports person or musician or um, who's already uh, at what, what, what level of education they've reached. But the teachers don't know enough at the moment about a new arrival. The new arrival walks in the door. Uh, and then you start having to deal with it. So th we are very aware at the moment of the need to support schools to help them um, identify more history and more and more of the culture and the uh, um, capability of the child. Um, so there are there are gaps in the education system. The in terms of the question about um, uh, well, you asked about localizing the human rights uh, issue, and also um, there are two things here. If we look at it from the point of view of the asylum-seeking child and learning also about what other countries do, I think we've got a lot we could learn from other countries. The Australians, for example, when they had African refugees arriving, did some really interesting things. And one of them was to um, develop a, a special supplementary teacher training certificate where the, the trainee had to go and work in the community of refugees and spend time there and learn how to work with refugees. Um, and you become a specialist 
in that area. Um, and that's something I think that would be extremely valuable for, for the UK. Um, and the other one is this notion of community, the elite Latinos the, the, um, in, the, in the US where we have community empowerment and really getting the community to start to be able, of course it has to be working as a community, which is difficult if families are not necessarily linked. Cambridge actually has quite a lot of community centers and language heritage centers. Um, but they actually, the way they work with schools, we found in all our research, and you're going back to the question about why they didn't want to come forward after the t uh, you saying they're not taking their benefits, we had enormous trouble trying to get a sample of, par of refugee parents or um, Eastern European parents to talk to us. I mean, almost every research study is getting two parents. We landed up with one Bulgarian. Um, from our Eastern European project. Um, we, the parents are very, very cautious. This is hardly surprising in a culture of fear, a culture of, of endless legal complexity. But why would you want to come forward to, to, to make yourself a visible? And our research, and we've mentioned it already, do, is it better to be visible or invisible? And we've had the history of the Second World War where being visible was dangerous. Um, with the Jewish community and of course it is a question do is it better to be visible and get special needs support or to integrate and be invisible um, that's a dilemma for, for every um, new arrival if you like Thank you. do you want to pick up on um, I'll, I'll pick up on uh, a few questions uh, yes what what happened with the fire in the tower and and, and uh, I mean I, I think the Obviously, there is always an option to, to uh, um, for for the hosting society to to show uh, compassion and to and to declare it more clearly and 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 and, and make it clear that people who will step forward, won't, nothing will happen to them, and, and and as soon as this thing will be open with the media, etc., they could be protected in that way. So, um, again, I'm 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 not an expert in in these things, but obviously these people are going through an ongoing suffering of an ongoing displacement in a way um, and uh, I'm sure that approaches could be find, found uh, uh, to, to help them. Um, the integrating families is a, is a really uh, important question uh, especially in, we are talking about urban absorption and, and because in camps people are separated and, 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 uh, and there is no such challenge. So the, the whole idea of um, of, uh, there is a notion today which is very popular, which is called urban, res urban resilience. Um, and, and the fact that uh, when, when cities absorb refugees, uh, the uh, support should also be given to the hosting society uh, in order to cope with the, with the refugees that they host. So it's, it's, it's always an, a, dual, a, a dual engagement between the refugees and the hosting societies. And we are talking about Cambridge and we can talk about other cities. and, and uh, uh, this is also um, related to improving facilities and housing sources. The UNHCR now also, uh, when, when uh, 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 a big number of refugees is absorbed in a, a certain location, uh, the, the, the UNHCR su supports the, the, the community itself. I mean, the schools are, are it supports the schools there, then the, and the other uh, facilities offered by, uh, by, by the community and by the municipality. So the community feels that it, ga it gains as well from, 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 the, from, the, from absorbing the refugees. Uh, and I think this approach could be taken um, uh, here as, uh, as well. Um, the the idea of improving housing stock, I think, again, it's it's, it's very important, and and I think we can create it. We, we can think creatively of, on other ways to to uh, to improve the the number and options of houses and housing uh, uh, in which refugees are uh, absorbed. There are many ways we can. Uh, I've just presented a few examples from the from Germany and the Netherlands and. Um, we can we can think about improving infrastructures and, and creating a sort of a maybe temporary housing or not because it will uh, obviously um, uh, and this temporary housing could absorb both refugees and and others from the community. So 
I mean, it could be a lot of, uh, of, of creating uh, ideas, uh, creative ideas we could, we could uh, think about uh, um, in, in, in the context of Cambridge and, and the UK. And the last question I want to, um, I want to uh, respond to is the, the, the question of the refugee camps which exist uh, for long periods of, times, of, of time. In Jordan they exist for 50, 60 years and uh, the, the average period of displacement today is 17 years. So these places exist for quite a long time. Um, and obviously these are very problematic spaces and, and places where people exist. I mean the whole idea of uh, existing in, in a temporary manner for, for years and re years without the ability to plan your life, without the ability to connect with, with you know, uh, on a permanent basis with your environment is, is very problematic and this is part of the reason why the UNHCR uh, is trying to avoid this. This is also the reason why Lebanon, for example, Jordan is opening, has opened uh, new uh, refugee camps after the Syrian crisis. Lebanon refused because of these, uh, th these problems. Obviously these places also become uh, uh, a political problem uh, because uh, because it's obviously a, a, a political issue of people who want to go back to, to the places from which they were displaced, like the Palestinians, but but others as well. Um, so this is the a part of the reason why why. Uh, why organizations and governments are trying to avoid camps. On the other hand, we can see the creation of camps by municipalities like in, in Paris and like Tempelhof in Berlin. So again, this is a, this is a, a complex uh, subject, but there is no doubt, and it's, it is now in almost all the, all the literature that camp could be very problematic to the people who are uh, supported there um, in many ways. Yeah. A lot of material we've covered, and, and I'll come back to people. It was interesting to hear some of the positive things from Australia. Said, I think it was the last but one election where uh, one of the major parties was saying that asylum seekers should be marooned on a desert island, and the other party was saying, no, they shouldn't be allowed to get to the desert island. Um, so Australia ha has sunk quite some way. There was a comment over there and then at the back. And again, I, I would implore people in, the, in, in this area, you are allowed to participate. As <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, Jordan. Uh, I was there recently on... Uh, Searching a vocational training project. And it was open there that the camp, there's a huge burden that the Jordanian government is, is carrying, um, mostly in the camps, but also a large number have been assimilated into families because of family ties, cross border family ties. But the main problem was the, um, the, the low skill of the, um, most of the immigrants, the, the refugees. And Jordan is, has got a very innovative program to provide vocational training, to upgrade skills, to assist people in entering the labor market, which is already, already very stressed by um, uh, uh, very high unemployment amongst young people. Um, but I think there's a lot we could learn from the provision of vocational training, bringing up their skills so that they can become assimilated within the, work, the workforce uh, and contribute to, to the labor market. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to share some more reflections on the Jordanian situation because I've worked with Iraqi refugees there in the cities as well as in and Syrian refugees in Zatari, and um, I think it's very important to kind of look at how the government there has coped with those waves of refugees over time, because certainly when I worked there, um, I went to talk to minorities who had come out of Iraq um, in the current crisis. And I kept on meeting families who had children who were 15 or 18 who had never had access to education because they were not given that right. So when new people were coming in, even though there was, you know, they were disappearing into cities and they were trying to be assimilated, they were not held in camps like Zatari, which is relatively new, um, they were coming up against young people who had literally been bored, f bored, literally bored at home for 15, 18, 20 years with absolutely no skills because they hadn't been given the rights to get education and work. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed and we can learn from when people are coming here. Uh, some powerful observations, yes. Um, sorry, it's almost on the opposite side of that, but I've also heard quite a lot of stories about 
doctors and academics in their home country that have been displaced and are finding the struggle of arriving here and having none of their qualifications recognized. So being at the University of Cambridge, is there something that can be done to provide training so that these qualifications and these skills are not lost and are to a standard that would make them employable or help them to reconvert um, within the UK? Mm. There's also, also some issues about the right to work, but that's another, another subject. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I might pick on somebody on this side if you don't. Uh, yeah. All right. Let me know if I'm too loud or if you can't hear me. Um, I'm wondering. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm wondering if um, if some of our our focus should be on um, the framing and the language we use. I think we started today with talking about refugee children um, because of uh, Professor Arno's specialization in education. Um, but it seems like we talk a lot about refugee children and unaccompanied minors because that seems like a relatively safe space um, because you can be quite empathetic and, and children can be framed as helpless. Um, whereas we're not you know, why, why is that? Why, why is that where we go when we talk about these things? We've talked about refugee families. Um, we don't talk about so, sort of, it's, it's even in this very privileged, very, I would assume, open-minded space, we still go to these topics of relative safety and relative comfort um, rather than other places. And so I'm, I'm wondering what um, we can say about that today, perhaps. to use this. Oh, there is one. Fantastic. Sorry. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, jumping off a few of the other comments we had, um, I was wondering about sort of the choice between when refugees come in, do you, do you put them together in a community so they can form a community amongst themselves, or do you sort of distribute them within the existing community? Maybe this is one of the things we can talk about uh, lessons we've learned from what's been successful elsewhere and what we've done here. So, so some really interesting thoughts. Anybody want to pick up on any of, of these? Can I go back? I mean, this notion of education in, in refugee camps is is absolutely critical, and the and there has been interest in trying to get um, to, to precisely to say how do you operationalise the right to education under the uh, say the rights of the child, the rights to education, the rights for, to be protected, to be safe. All are highly relevant to a refugee camp, and they're not necessarily, as you rightly point out, the education, the schools aren't there, or the schools are actually have been shaped in a way that they can't become citizens of that country that they're in. And when I said about removing the statelessness, how many years does a child have to be living in a country before they, if they're born and they live in the country, before they become a member of that country? So the, the refugees in Jordan, how many generations, and they're still not Jordanian. Um, and that's happened to the Palestinians and, and now to the Syrians. So, and that is certainly on the agenda, and that's one of the issues for the Council of Europe, saying they're now going to work on that, saying what plan should we have to, to say that you are actually from that country now? Because you have spent 10 years of your life, 18 years of your life in that country. Why can you not be a member of it? Um, so I think that is, on the, that is now on, going to be on the agenda. And the uh, push to, to, to build schools in refugee camps is, I think, a major agenda now. Um, the, in terms of training, retraining people coming in, for example, to Cambridge, the, after the war, the CARA was set up. No, just, but actually during the war, I think, rather than after the war, uh, which was precisely to help people who had a high level of education, professional qualifications, to be able to move across into Britain and, and work. Um, and the organization still exists, but I don't know how much it's addressing the, the current Syrian crisis and um, people, are, individuals are being brought into Cambridge on that basis. Um, Cambridge actually had a history on um, the Second World War of really helping refugees come in and, uh, and the Kindersport and the CARA. Um, but I, the, the, 
I think, I mean, the, one of the things that has been developing, and I'm sure there are people here who know more about it than I do, about whether one can have scholarships and um, for students to come to the universities here uh, who are, have refugee backgrounds. Um, it's not an easy thing to organize, but it's actually to, to campaign. This college has a history of, um, of it set up the South African Fund in order to help people after apartheid. And, um, and to help people to, to fund education in southern Africa. Um, and that was in the 1970s. And there is no reason why one can't have a similar fund to help refugees uh, to come uh, to either in, in there where they're living now or to help people come here. So I think that that would involve a campaign. Um, the, um, the, the question that you were asking about the, the category, um, I think in education really we're now using the, the new language is the newly arrived and wherever they're coming from. But the newly arrived could be refugees, asylum seekers, um, but also we've got the issue of the Eastern European children and what's happening to them. Um, so I, I think it, it's not in our fields, it's actually a rather, it's a divided research field, which is very unfortunate. Um, you're right to say that the refugee issue is, has produced empathy. There's the less empathy to think about the Eastern European child who's out there in the fields of East Anglia um, and how they experience the school system and what's going to happen to them. So it's, it is better, to, I think, to have a larger category, uh, the, whether you say migrant child or... New, or um, there's a real problem with language here, <laughs> which has not been resolved. So you're raising a very important issue. No, uh, no. Schools, by the way, only classify them, as you know, by their language, whether they have ad English as additional language is the only label they're given. And it's not a successful label in our view. Uh, it really hides the ethnic, social class um, categories through the language perspective. Yeah? Well, well, say that there are and we don't know precisely, but say there are 50 refugee families in Cambridge. Um, the, I mean, some of the issues that came up in that last sort of range of points are really interesting and challenging. You, you then got to, as, as, you've, as has been said, you've got to think, well, where have they come from? Are they urban, rural? What's their education level? Clearly English and the uh, focus with, um, um, with a wonderful supply of English tutors. Um, uh, on the Syrian families, um, many of them aren't urban. Um, they, uh, some are. Um, they've got virtually no English. They are very proud of being Syrian. Um, you're definitely talking bicultural and needing to be bilingual. In time, the children will be partly of the root of the assimilation because they will be the root that the parents then get to know English parents that they they uh, get uh, in through the school. So. It definitely relates in a very big way to who's coming and what their aspirations are. Um, do you want to stay? I mean, clearly they've got to make an assessment about what they must want. A lot of them want to go back to their country, but, they, but then they're looking at a situation that's go on for a significant number of time, a significant amount of time. So um, in Cambridge terms, uh, they would be pretty well assimilated but not without challenge on some of the schools um, helped by the fact that there are quite a lot of Arabic people, Arabic speaking people in, in, in Cambridge um, it spread around um, there are just certainly we, we do need to just think about all of those issues and just um, feed off the aspirations of the families um, uh, whilst encouraging um, the refugee communities to be significant and support each other. So why do a lot of the asylum seekers uh, who, or people who get refugee status um, end up in large cities? Because they are part of communities that they feel part of. Um, they can be both supported but also make their way in the UK. And for some, they would find Cambridge really quite daunting, I think. Um, do you want to comment on this question about whether the evidence says anything about sort of whether it's better to mix or disperse? I mean, is there any evidence on what, what's better for? Um, I think the evidence will show that the, the, the answer is complex because it, it is very much depend, depends on, on, on the environment, on the refugees themselves, on their age, uh, gender sometimes. Uh, I mean, I know that uh, just for uh, from personal acquaintance with a few cases that 
some refugees here in Cambridge and in, and in the UK when they are absorbed within other communities could become very lonely and, and, and support from other refugee uh, families is very important. So I think, th I think uh, th there, is, there is an issue of balance of, 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 uh, of how, how um, of how to uh, how to create a, a specific mix which will be good uh, to 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 both again the uh, the refugees and uh, and the communities and, and tailored specifically to who these specific people are. I mean, again, we're saying refugees in general, and we talked about cata uh, the the category. I mean, these are people, and they are different. The same as uh, the, you and I are different. I mean, we are very different, and and, and the attitude should be uh, should at best to, to try to, to be tailored uh, uh, specifically um, to, to, to each case. Um, in relation to the question of, of Jordan and, and uh, both, uh, and I'll, 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 be, I'll, I'll relate more to the, uh, to the ongoing absorption of, of, of the, the, this country experience. So there were uh, Palestinian refugees and, and Iraqi refugees and, and uh, refugees from, from uh, the war in Lebanon and, and now Syrians and, and Jordan is really an example of, 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 of a country which uh, uh, absorb ongoing waves of, of, of uh, refugees um, in different ways. What can, what, what can I, I, I can say is obviously um, the attitudes uh, of, of absorption again is, is, is different and depends who the group of refugees is and, and depends sometimes how wealthy they are and how uh, uh, the, 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 the situation is very again much depends on, on, on who they are and, and where they're coming from but again the, the situation now in, in Jordan is, is, is a bit on, on a, at, a, at a tipping point. It's, 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 uh, the country is very much currently under a lot of pressure uh, of, 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 of the ongoing uh, absorption of, of Syrian refugees. And, um, and again, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, obviously it's a UK issue and a Western world issue and, and the, the, a global issue which is much, much broader than the, the discussion here. Um, and, and it's, and and the issue for the society and the state itself is is, is broader than than uh, discussing a specific group of refugees or uh, uh, and the way that is it is absorbed either in, in camps or in, or in urban areas. The Jordan itself is under um, a lot of pressure. Um, so yeah, I think we only have a, a little bit of time left. But if there are a few more burning comments, yes, over there over there, um, and I'll try and fit in those two, and I'll have one final question for the panel. Um, sorry, I'd just like to ask uh, Lewis and, and others, uh, what are the specific obstacles, uh, government policy, national government policy obstacles to Cambridge, somewhere like Cambridge, taking more refugees? Can you pick up on that either briefly when we get onto it, if that's all right? Um, there was a question over there. And then there were two over there. So. That's lovely, thank you. I wanted to touch actually on the professional side of things, um, coming from a health background. And in 2001, 2002, working in Yorkshire in, in the hospitals there, there was actually the facility uh, for clinical attachments for doctors who were professional. Um, and living in the hospital accommodation myself, um, there was actually um, Syrian, um, we had Lebanese, Iraqi doctors, and I have stayed in touch over the course of the couple of years. Um, thankfully, integrated now consultants, and they actually came in um, at sort of registrar consultant level, retrained, did all of their English training, um, and I you know, successfully integrated, but I suspect the NHS program is slightly different because I haven't seen any more doctors since then doing clinical attachments, perhaps. Um, that is also something we need to... Uh, the, by clinical attachment, what I mean is they would actually shadow the consultants and see how British doctors are practicing. Um, so I thought that was very useful for them. My own uh, research at the moment is looking um, at food access and I was thinking about the housing in Cambridge. I had a look at the refugee um, and asylum report by um, I think it was Eddie's group um, and I looked at the postcodes of the area and also printed off um, sections on the map which food 
sex um, shops and um, facilities they have. And when I'm doing my research, what's coming up with the women is that um, the first year of migration is particularly high for food insecurity. Um, when they are more settled or they have support networks, they will actually commute for about an hour up, um, which obviously has implications for the new refugee families without support. And touching on integration, in Estonia, for example, we've got cultural sensitivity issues, we've got migrants who are wanting to move on, my husband's from Estonia, because they are spread out so rurally. And a lot of the women are also able to access an allotment side of things. They're used to fresh food. So thinking practically about what we can offer within Cambridge um, is perhaps something we do need to think of um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, with food access. Thank you. Some really interesting stuff there. And just these two over here briefly, if we can, because then we do need to, to wrap up and let people escape. Hi, um, I'll just keep my question short. Um, it's sort of on the topic of, you know, earlier we decided that we're going through the sort of easy, easy problems or the, the easy questions. So I wanted to ask what happens if you know, the refugees do not integrate in our society. They come with different values, different ways of doing things that really just don't seem to fit. Basically, that's what. Okay. To ask. And the last comment at the front. Um, in Germany, where um, the settlement of, of uh, registered refugees is, is quite uh, strict, <laughs> um, uh, the families don't have the opportunity necessarily to move closer to the people they know. But in uh, the UK, obviously, we have a different situation. So um, with that in mind, and also in mind that uh, the council here is very interested in um, helping refugees resettle in Cambridge and that also the people of Cambridge are very welcoming as well. Um, I'm curious to know what the City Council is doing to actually try to attract refugees here, um, no noting that uh, housing is so expensive. Are there any uh, um, actions being taken from the Council to provide affordable housing as a, as a way of attracting refugees. Well, thank you very much for some really interesting points. The one question I was going to throw to all of these, to all of, of the panel is, what would you say is the one most important thing for people in Cambridge to do or campaign for right now? Um, so that can just be a one sentence response. Um, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the other things. And then we are going to wrap up. So uh, any sort of final thoughts and comments? Lewis, do you want to start, given there's um, a few specific things for you? Wow. Um, so, I, I mean, first of all, if I just record, I found, I found this evening um, a lot more uh, thought-provoking on some of the issues, and we've got a further session tomorrow looking at the research um, uh, on, in terms of the refugees that are here. Um, so some of the threads lead into Julian's question. Um, the, I mean, clearly we, we have got a government that's just restricting and controlling um, who's coming in. So I, I would like to know from the government um, what opportunities and how are you best going to help the 1,500 or whatever number it is um, that, are, uh, that came into the country that way? Um, Julian's probably got better information than I have on the number of asylum seekers and other refugees that come in. Many of those are rooted in this region, they're rooted into Norwich, Ipswich and Peterborough, but even larger numbers have been rooted into cities in, in other regions. Um, I, th I think it, um, so. So I think there's clearly there is a, 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 there is a, a case to be made from Cambridge to say, well, how what what could we really do? And I think some of this, the issue which was first raised in the in, uh, right right near the beginning, is that a lot of the skills and talents of the people that come aren't recognised. So some of them can't get jobs in their equivalent profession, whether it's being a pharmacist or whether it's being sort of um, someone who inspects meat or whatever. Um, so I think where Cambridge could play a role is in offering uh, to help would actually be in looking at the transferring of the skills and saying to the government, look, we're an education centre, we could help um, people who come in. We could specifically translate their skills. We've got uh, the, an affluent university, the colleges could perhaps assist. We've got Bangley Ruskin and other institutions. So I think we could 
specifically say, look, give us people who've got educational talent and we will help them fulfill their opportunities and thereby earn income. Um, so I think that's one route. And I just think just, um, uh, yeah, overall, um, yeah, the, the, I mean, we, we, we can do more. We, as as um, the Cambridge Resettlement, we, uh, Refugee Resettlement Campaign has assisted with, if we got offered quality accommodation, we can't just take all of the council accommodation that comes available, available. We could help more. We have said to the Home Office, can we help single people? We've said we've now got Arabic staff. Could, we can help people from other countries, not just Syria. We've obviously got a flourishing mosque. So I think the, one, the, the, the two threads are, A, we could enable education to be a mean achievement and the second we could help a lot more because um, we could if the Home Office were to agree help a lot of single people and, and certainly um, more people if, uh, because there is more accommodation that we can be made available in an integrated fashion not a community within one part of the town. Thank you Les. Who wants to comment briefly next? Sorry, well, sorry. I, I could comment uh, really uh, briefly on uh, first uh, the kind of provocative question of what happens when refugees uh, do not integrate it is obviously a very difficult question because again there are different cases of, of why and, and they're not it, in, they do not integrate perhaps if they will move to a different place or to a different table they will uh, I mean I guess the, the answer could be similar to other migrants. People just, if they do not feel comfortable in one place, they just move on until until they, they, they do find themselves. And uh, but I think all of the support of the com all of the community support should be given uh, to, to to that that integration uh, will will succeed and, and, and support will succeed. Um, and about uh, about what should we campaign for? Uh, I will also go back to this idea of of, uh, of starting uh, or, or initiating a, a campaign of, uh, of which is related to the university, the universities here, uh, which could uh, s together um, create uh, possibly schemes which will uh, uh, support uh, prospect students and professionals, uh, uh, perhaps with. Uh, with scholarships and, and, and other uh, professional support, uh, because people do arrive here with uh, with quite a lot of yeah, skills and talented talents that should be used, and it's, it, it relates back to the question of integrate of integration. When people are doing what they know and, and like to do, they're often often better integrated. So uh, I think that's my. Well, I'm not sure I call it a campaign; it's a, a strategy. Um, I think that we already uh, we're already an international city, and I think. We, we, we've known for that in terms of what we've been fighting for, for the internationalism of our, of our staff here uh, in the university, in the community, etc. But I think that we, I don't get the impression yet that we've got firm partnerships with, um, for example, I, we, then we could learn from these partnerships, for example, partnerships with like the city of Cologne, city of Stockholm, or Paris, what are they doing? How are they coping with migration? And to, to actually have Cambridge as having those partnerships, into, uh, particularly in the European yeah. context at the moment, um, um, and sharing uh, and learning from them strategically about urban governance, but also about the, it's not just urban, it is actually about our region. Um, we have huge resources on the digital and, and information technology side that could be linked. We're not linking, it seems to me, um, I mean, we've just set, set up, we've, in the university, we've got the Cambridge Migration Research um, Network, which I founded with a, a, a professor of criminology, Lorraine Gelsorp. There's also, we're setting up a center for the study of global human movement. It's not just refugees. Refugees are vastly important at the personal level. But the issue is how, do, how does a country deal with the movement of people? And how do you adapt your systems to that movement? And we've got all sorts of movements in this city. It's not it, it, really quite a lot of it. And, um, a different populations here doing different things. So I would go for that twinning uh, and, and shared knowledge so we get the knowledge, the skills, the careers that will, if you like, an experimental model. 
Well, thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but um, I hope, like me, you found it really interesting. I think we identified maybe not the answers to every problem, but perhaps some of the questions and some of the areas that more work is needed. Uh, and I hope this will lead to many more conversations. But thank you very much to all of you for coming. Uh, thank you particularly to Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign and Cambridge City of Sanctuary for, for our, being our partners in this, and, and to Jenny and Leone for their work running around. It's been fantastic. Um, we have tried to capture and record every single thing that's happened here, and we hope to make that available shortly so you can go through and, and think through many of the issues. And huge thanks to, to Damien and Mark who are up through the wall over there controlling all these cameras uh, doing a, a fantastic job uh, recording that. Also from my perspective many thanks to Sarah who took on a huge amount of the work organising this particularly while I was away doing something else for a few weeks. Um, it's, been, it's been really fantastic. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Do sign up if you'd like to hear about any more of the things we do. Follow us on Twitter. Um, really do get engaged. Um, and finally before, before I um, ask you to join me in a round of applause for all the people who've spoken. The College Bar, which is on the other side of the court, is open if you would like to experience one of our other new facilities and also some extremely nice drinks and some food. So thank you very much and thank you particularly to our panel. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. Thank you very much. Just